Thank you for joining us for this information session. Tonight, we will be discussing the online and part-time graduate programs in mechanical engineering offered at the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Cheryl Williams, and I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Marketing for the Whiting School of Engineering. With me tonight is Dr. Greg Cherichian. Dr. C is the chair of our online and part-time programs in mechanical engineering. He also works in our Department of Mechanical Engineering as a professor for our full-time programs and the director of our robot and protein kinematics laboratory. Dr. C was the first professor specializing in robotics hired by Johns Hopkins Mechanical Engineering Department during our information session for our full-time master's program in robotics, Dr. Noah Cowan credits Dr. C as the beginning of the robotics program at Hopkins. His research interests include applied mathematics, computational structural biology, conformational statistics and biological macromolecules, hyperredundant robotic robotic manipulator arms, and self-replicating robotic systems. He has published extensively, including three books, and holds at least two patents. Dr. C, would you like to say hello? Hello, everybody. Looking forward to talking with you tonight. All right. Thank you, Dr. C. For tonight's presentation, we'll start off with an introduction to Johns Hopkins Engineering. Next, Dr. C will discuss with you our online and part-time degree programs in mechanical engineering. Then we'll review some helpful information on tuition and payment options, talk about next steps and important dates, and we'll end with a live question and answer session. If you have any questions at any point in the presentation, please type them into the questions tab on the control panel. If you are joining us via a cell phone or a tablet this evening, select the question mark to access the question section. We'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. So why study engineering at Johns Hopkins University? Johns Hopkins University was founded in 1876 as the nation's first research university. The School of Engineering opened its doors in 1913, and in 1915, it began offering part-time engineering coursework as night classes for technical workers. Since then, we've grown to offer more than 20 master's programs that can be completed part-time. 18 of these programs can be completed entirely online. Our programs are designed by people who thoroughly understand your industry. Our faculty are all expert and working engineers and technical professionals. Our faculty and instructional designers construct new and update existing coursework every year so that it includes the most up-to-date information. In addition to our part-time programs, the Whiting School of Engineering has over 25 research centers and institutes. This includes our strong partnership with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. We also offer full-time bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs that are conducted in residence at our Homewood campus in Baltimore. Our online and part-time programs are led by respected senior engineers from our Applied Physics Laboratory and faculty from our full-time programs. We are ranked in the top 20 best online graduate engineering programs by US News & World Report. And of all the schools that are included in these rankings, we have the largest online part-time student population. So not only will you have lots of fellow students going through a similar learning experience, but these rankings really speak to the quality of our programs regardless of our size, and our school is experienced and well-equipped to help you navigate graduate education as an online student. The degree that you earn studying with us part-time is of the same quality as our full-time degree program. Your diploma will not say online or part-time. You are eligible and highly encouraged to participate in commencement. And as a graduate, you will be one of more than 28,000 Whiting School alumni and will join our esteemed international alumni community. So that is an overview of who we are and the value of our programs. Now Dr. C is going to talk to you more about mechanical engineering. Dr. C? Okay, thanks Cheryl. So um, our mechanical engineering program uh, has a number of, of different uh, sub-specializations, uh, which I'll tell you about. But first, we'll, we'll go through a little bit about the curriculum. 
So, um, so we offer two uh, sorts of, of uh, venues. One is the one degree is the Master of Mechanical Engineering degree. That's the main product of our program. Uh, and then we offer also a post uh, ma a post master's certificate after somebody's completed their master's and has been out in the field for a while and wants to brush up. So I'll go over both of these. So uh, within the mechanical engineering uh, masters of uh, the online master's degree in the EP program, there are, uh, are four focus areas: uh, manufacturing, solids and mechanics of materials, thermofluids and robotics and controls. And each of these uh, has a, a, as a foundation uh, a common core, and then uh, we build on the specialization after that. So all, in all of these, uh, the first course that students take is a, is an, a math course, math, mathematical methods for engineers. Actually, just this last year, we've broken that out into three different specialized versions of the same course, where there's uh, one of them has an emphasis on manufacturing and robotics, another one has an emphasis on thermofluids, and another has an emphasis on mechanics. Um, and then after taking that math course, um, there are uh, e each of these focus areas has two required courses that uh, students take, and then uh, three uh, technical electives within the focus area. And then of the remaining four courses, those are uh, technical electives uh, that can be taken from any area in mechanical engineering or any technical area in EP. I mean, if those four elective courses could be taken from, for example, electrical engineering or civil engineering or space systems, um, we do uh, we do uh, put a limit on the number of management and uh, systems engineering courses of two. So two up to two out of those four could be management or systems type courses. Uh, but other than that, the, those four electives are completely free. So here's a sample program for the manufacturing focus area. Um, so as with all of the MEEP uh, degrees, uh, we start with the mathematical methods for engineers. Then uh, the two uh, focus area required courses for manufacturing are computer integrated design and manufacturing and manufacturing systems analysis. Uh, then in this sample program, it followed with three uh, manufacturing related courses, control systems for mechanical engineering applications, uh, advanced manufacturing systems, and uh, computer aided design. And then three, uh, the four remaining technical electives or uh, uh, three, three electives in this particular um, uh, sample, you can see that uh, introduction to project management is listed. So that's a management course. Um, another technical course, engineering materials uh, was, was selected. Uh, introduction to systems engineering. So here's an example where there's one management course, one systems engineering course, and then introduction to electronic packaging. So uh, this is kind of a very typical manufacturing focus uh, breakdown. Um, I'll, I'll add that in our manufacturing focus, we've just added a couple of new courses. One is called Mechanized Assembly, and we've, uh, together with the Material Science Program, uh, are offering now a sequence of added, additive manufacturing uh, courses. So those also would fit within the manufacturing focus. So here's another sample program. This is for the solids or mechanics of materials area. Again, the sample program starts with uh, the math methods course, and then the two required uh, courses for this uh, focus area are advanced strength of materials and intermediate vibrations. Uh, and then uh, following that are uh, uh, focus area courses more broadly speaking, the computer-aided design course, uh, intermediate heat transfer, and the uh, the uh, engineering materials 
course. And then the four free technical electives in this case are the computational methods of analysis, which is a, an ME course, a material science, uh, intermediate electromagnetics, which is an e ECE course, and then Space Systems 1, which is in the Space Systems program in EP. So in the uh, thermofluids area, um, the, again, the first required course is the math methods course, and uh, the two uh, focus area required courses are intermediate fluid dynamics and intermediate heat transfer, and then the free focus area courses are combustion, uh, applied fluid dynamics, and applied heat transfer. And then for the four uh, free electives, uh, this student chose all of their free electives within ME, uh, which uh, topics in data analysis, uh, design for manufacturability, precision engineering, and, uh, and CAD. So actually most of these free electives are in the manufacturing area. Um, but, you know, so this is sort of a straight ME curriculum. Uh, all of the courses were taken within ME. And finally, uh, the fourth uh, example here is from the robotics and controls area. Again, starting with the math methods course. And again, in the last year, we've tailored the math methods course so that it's broken down. Uh, it's, it cl more closely fits the particular focus interests of, of the student. Um, the, uh, the two required courses, kinematics and dynamics of robots, and control systems for mechanical engineering applications are taken. And then uh, three uh, focus area uh, free courses or technical electives, uh, robot control, digital control systems for applications, and robot motion planning. And again, these, um, these courses in this uh, area, or in the, 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 the free courses within the focus area, there's a selection from which to choose. It's not that these three are the required ones. There's a, a much broader selection, but this student chose these three. And then there are the four technical electives, uh, which this student chose, uh, again, in ME, but outside of the robotics and controls area, computational methods of analysis, topics in data analysis, intermediate dynamics, and uh, CAD. So in addition to the uh, Master of Mechanical Engineering degree, we have the Post uh, Master's Certificate, which consists of six courses taken over a period of three years. And there's no restriction on which ME courses are taken, but, but we do require that they be ME courses. And this is just a way for students who have already completed their, their master's maybe several years ago, uh, to sort of refresh on new developments in the field. Uh, in contrast, the, uh, the master's degree is a 10 course uh, de uh, degree, uh, and there's a limit of five years to, to complete the master's degree. The six course post uh, master's certificate, uh, there's a requirement to complete those courses over three years. So in terms of the admissions requirements, um, it's, uh, it's required that uh, students who are admitted have a bachelor's degree. Most of them uh, coming in uh, have uh, mechanical engineering bachelor's degrees, but that's not a strict requirement. There are many closely related engineering disciplines like engineering mechanics, aerospace engineering, um, you know, and uh, so, uh, and, and even it happens that some some folks with electrical engineering or civil engineering or uh, you know even naval architecture degrees and, and others uh, come in, even some physics and, and math students uh, uh, at the bachelor level come in and want a, a master's in mechanical engineering. And there is some flexibility there. The most important thing is to have good grades in, in the core math courses like linear algebra, uh, Calc 1, 2, and 3, et cetera. Uh, and most of our students who, uh, who are admitted and matriculate into our program have grade point averages at the undergraduate level of 3.3 or higher, but that's not a strict cutoff. Uh, you know, if somebody got a C in uh, philosophy or, you know, German language class or whatever, 
and that pool did keep the eighty down. That's not it's not a deal breaker to be less than a three point three. We also have a lot of students who uh, who have three point sevens, three point eights. I mean, so it it's uh, uh, the grade point. This is a rule of thumb in terms of the grade point average. Oh, right. And uh, we don't require the GREs for admissions. Um, there are several uh, pathways to obtaining the uh, Master of Mechanical Engineering degree within EP. Uh, one can take courses completely online, and those online courses are in a flipped setting. So in other words, uh, there are narrated slides by the instructor. Uh, the students go through those narrated slides. Uh, complete homework assignments and uh, and and interact with the instructor through online office hours and email and, and phone conversations. Um, that is probably the largest contingent of, of our students uh, do the degree fully or almost fully online. Uh, and then there's the option of taking some courses on site. We have some experimental courses that are taught on site uh, at the Kosakoff Center uh, at, AP, at the Applied Physics Lab, like our mechatronics course is, is an, um, is, is an in-person course uh, within EP. And then it's also possible for EP students to take uh, full-time courses on the Homewood campus. So, uh, so Cheryl, you want me to talk about the the locations as well? I I can review them quickly if you would like. Yeah, that would be great. Sure, sure. So if you're asking yourself where where is the Applied Physics Laboratory, where is this Homewood campus? Uh, here is a map of the Washington D.C. and Baltimore. Uh, metro areas and you can see here the applied physics laboratory is located in laurel maryland it's it's kind of located between uh, baltimore and dc uh, and then uh, the homewood campus is located right in the in the heart of of baltimore so uh, the majority of the the on-site uh, course offerings that are available in this program are taught at the Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, our full-time program in mechanical engineering is actually uh, based out of or conducted in residence at our Homewood campus in, in, uh, in Baltimore. All right, thank you so much, Dr. C. Uh, now we'd like to share some information to help you take this next step, uh, the most common questions that our admissions team gets from prospective students is what is the tuition and what resources are available to help me pay? So here it is. Our tuition is currently $4,250 per course. Our courses are each three credits. So this is the total tuition cost for each three credit course. Because our tuition fluctuates every year due to inflation, we encourage students to budget $45,000 total for their degree. This cost uh, may exclude books and materials. The cost of books and materials does vary depending on the coursework that you register for. But in addition to tuition, you, our students do not pay any uh, annual fees. So there's no technology fee that our students will need to pay. Uh, we do not charge our online and part-time students a student, student union fee, for example. We do not charge a fee to submit your application for admissions, so there is no application fee. The only fee that our students pay is a fee at the end of their course of study with us, uh, known as a graduate's fee. You have a variety of financing options available to you depending on your personal circumstance. I really encourage you to investigate and to take advantage of any education benefits that your employer may offer. Uh, the majority of our students uh, are actually receiving some sort of employer provided tuition assistance so reach out to your supervisor reach out to your HR department you know investigate what options are available to you if you are a uh, qualifying if you're a US resident or a uh, qualifying US resident excuse me let me start that again if you are a US citizen or a qualifying US resident, you may be eligible to use financial aid 
The financial aid that is available for graduate students is largely unsubsidized loans. So similar to that, you can of course finance your degree through a personal loan. We unfortunately do not offer any scholarships uh, or have any scholarships available for our online and part-time graduate students but there are other associations and organizations that do. For example, the National Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering, otherwise known as the National GEM Consortium, does offer fellowship programs. Rules, requirements, and application instructions can be found on GEM's website. The application for these fellowship programs is open from July 1st to November 30th. Uh, and last, uh, if you are a uh, active duty or retired military and you have veterans benefit benefits, you can of course utilize these to finance your education. Speaking of which, we do have a number of active duty and retired military enrolled in our online and part-time programs. If you are planning on using veterans benefits to finance your education, here are some things to keep in mind. The URL that you see here on your screen, ep.jhu.edu backslash veterans, has some great information on what forms you need to submit in order to utilize veterans benefits at Johns Hopkins. For students using Chapter 33 post 9-11 benefits, the Department of Veterans Affairs sets an annual cap on tuition for private schools. That cap is $23,671.94. So we just discussed um, tuition costs. This annual cap, by the way, is for one full academic school year. It includes the fall, spring, and summer semesters, and then it renews every fall. Five courses with a us will cost you $21,250, so that is underneath the tuition cap. Six courses uh, will cost you $25,500, so it will exceed the tuition cap. Johns Hopkins is a yellow ribbon school. How yellow ribbon works at Johns Hopkins is that it is applied once the tuition cap has been exceeded and if it is exceeded qualifying students can receive up to a thousand dollars per year it's awarded on a first come first serve basis coming this fall there are some changes regarding how the va will be calculating the housing allowance for chapter 33 recipients vah your basic housing allowance will be calculated using the zip code for your on-site classes i.e the physical location of the classroom utilized we are also happy to announce that Hopkins offers various networking opportunities for our veteran students. For current students, there is an online networking group uh, available via LinkedIn. Just simply search the Johns Hopkins University Veterans Connection Group or Johns Hopkins Veterans in order to locate that group. For alumni, we have a networking group that's offered through our alumni affinity office. So just visit alumni.jhu.edu to learn more information. Students who are educated outside of the U.S. do have some additional admissions requirements. They are that they must submit an international credit evaluation of any credit earned at non-U.S. institutions. We prefer that students go through WES, that's a third-party credit evaluation company service, uh, to get this evaluation. From WES, the product you want to request is called the ICAP. These students also must submit proof of English proficiency via, for example, qualifying scores on a TOEFL exam. Unfortunately, international students studying on an F1 student visa are not eligible to enroll uh, in this program or not eligible to enroll uh, in on-site coursework. Uh, typically, international students are permitted to enroll in our programs uh, and study online from their home country. Uh, unfortunately, uh, across all of our programs, we are moving, we're not unfortunately, we're, we're moving our coursework more and more online at the request of our students. Uh, and so because of that, uh, kind of unilaterally across all of our programs, the registrar's office has decided that they can no longer issue the form I-20, which is what is necessary for a student studying on an F-1 student visa. They need that form I-20. Uh, to maintain their visa status. It basically affirms the location that they're taking an on-site classroom, a class with the university. So um, if you are an international student and you uh, are joining us right now from another country, you are permitted to, to study 
with us in this program. You just have to study with us online. All right, so next steps and important dates. If you are interested in studying with us, your next step is to submit your application for admissions. You can do this by visiting ep.jhu.edu backslash apply. After submitting your application for admissions, you'll need to submit your academic transcripts and your professional resume. Instructions for how to do that are actually included on our application website. So it's, it's all of the directions are included in the text above the application form. We offer rolling admissions for our online and part-time programs. Uh, typically, it takes us four to six weeks from when we receive a student's completed, complete application package, so uh, their online application, their transcripts, their professional resume, four to six weeks to evaluate that packet and then issue that student a decision letter. So with that in mind, here are some important dates. The Fall semester is really right around the corner and fall registration opens on July the 5th. The fall semester begins on August the 27th. If you're interested in studying with us for the fall, please submit your application materials ASAP as soon as possible. Our spring semester registration opens on October the 25th and it, uh, the semester begins on January the 28th. So we, you still have tons of time to submit your application materials if you're interested in studying with us in the spring. And that is the end of the prepared portion of this presentation. Now I'd like to open it up uh, to, to all of you. Uh, so that Dr. C can answer any questions you may have on this, this program. Um, for all of us who have joined us kind of, uh, you know, later on in the presentation, how you can ask Dr. C a question is simply by typing it in, um, accessing the questions tab on your, your control panel and then typing your question in. Uh, if you're joining us via a cell phone or a tablet, simply select the question mark to access the question section. All right. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Dr. C, yep. are you ready for your first question? I hope so. <laughs> All right. So um, if you don't know the answer to this question, Dr. C, I will investigate it for the attendee after this presentation. But uh, Sounds like a hard one. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Hey, it's a question about tuition. So it says, uh, is your tuition locked in once you begin taking courses or does it fluctuate? Um, I believe that uh, that that there's a, a, a gradual annual increase, uh, sort of, uh, you know, roughly speaking, kind of like cost of living kind of increase. So like 3% or so a year. So uh, and that's factored into the, the number that you mentioned for the overall uh, cost of the degree because the current cost of of each course I think was 4250 but the total cost of the degree was was uh, 45,000 so that factors in a gradual increase over the years excellent excellent and so uh, you know it's really depends on how much coursework uh, you complete within a particular year. If you can complete um, five or six courses in a year, um, you won't have to worry about that cost increase. Yeah, and mo much. most students most students do take one or two courses per term, and there are three terms per year, fall, spring, summer. Um, so when I said that the degree needs to be completed within five years, that's an upper bound. Uh, many students finish the degree within three years. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Next question. Are programs like CAD and MATLAB uh, included in the tuition? So the access to the, uh, so the CAD program, like CREO uh, or AutoCAD, that's, yeah, that's part of the course, as far as I know. MATLAB has a student license, which I think costs about $100. Um, I'm actually not sure it, uh, well, I mean, there's a, certainly Hopkins has a site license for MATLAB, um, but to tell you the truth, I don't know how that, that works for remote students. So that's I, something we need to look into. I'm ha happy know. to look into that and then, um, and then follow up with 
with uh, with this attendee. All right. Okay. The next question. Give me one moment. Oh, okay. So this this attendee says my undergraduate degree is in biomedical engineering. Is it recommended to take some follow up courses at a community college or just apply? Um, if you have the core math, uh, engineering math, which I presume you would in biomedical engineering, you know, Calc 1, 2, 3, and linear algebra, um, then you would not need to, and, and if you did sufficiently well, meaning, let's say, a, a B or better in all of those core math courses, um, then there would be no need for, uh, for taking any additional uh, courses before starting the, the ME master's. Wonderful. Uh, the next question, uh, this question has to do with uh, the GPA requirement. Uh, if I don't have the best GPA during my undergrad, can work experience help my chances of getting in? Um, well, depends what you mean by not having the best GPA. So um, when I mentioned the 3.3, that's not a requirement for admissions. It's, uh, it's just a statement of fact that most of the students who do come in have GPAs, uh, you know, in that range or, or better, but that's a statement that most do. Um, there are other students who have GPAs in the range 3.0 to 3.3, um, and we do take into account uh, work experience. Um, I, I would often say, though, that, it, you know, if somebody got C's in their basic math courses um, back in their you know, undergraduate days 10 or 15 years ago. And then if they went and they, you know, they were doing project management or, or, or whatnot uh, out in industry, um, probably their, their core math skills have not improved over that time. So um, as a way to, uh, let's say, ameliorate the, um, the GPA issue, um, I might ask somebody to go and take, you know, courses at a community college in, in those math courses and get a B plus or better um, to show that they've matured intellectually and that GPA, the poor GPA or not the best GPA in the world uh, is in their past. All right, excellent. Uh, Next question, is it possible to select elective courses from the applied physics department or in bio, uh, uh, biomedical engineering, for example? And, you know, if I can say this, Dr. C, they, we actually have had um, a couple of attendees asking um, whether or not they can take kind of any two electives within the Whiting School. So, so it's, it's uh... Uh, remember, it, there are uh, four free uh, technical electives uh, out of the 10, and those could be taken from biomedical engineering. Those could be taken from uh, applied physics, space systems. I mean, we have tw 20 different uh, degrees in the EP program or pro EP programs from which those four technical electives could be taken. They could also be taken from the full time program, uh, the Whiting School uh, full-time engineering program. I should say, though, that, that the courses, uh, the on-site courses are more expensive than, than the EP courses. And that reflects the fact that the, the full-time tuition is much greater than the EP tuition. So those courses, the tuitions are charged on a prorated basis for EP students who would like to take them uh, on the Hopkins campus with the, the full-time students. So, um, and the only, the only real uh, constraint in, in, the, in the selection of those four technical electives within the, the pure mechanical engineering uh, EP degree is that we limit the number of management and systems engineering courses that, that are taken because there's a separate degree, um, the master's in uh, technical management, which is half 
technical courses, such as mechanical engineering, and half uh, management courses. So if somebody wanted to take more than two uh, management or systems courses, then, then they could choose to, take, to go that option for that master's degree rather than the, the straight uh, mechanical engineering technical master's degree. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and along those same lines, uh, we, we were just talking about kind of the different courses available. Uh, the Homewood campus, uh, the, the classes that are available in our full-time programs, they are conducted uh, during kind of normal work hours. So they're, they're kind of daytime courses. Uh, just to give everyone a, a heads up about that, our, um, our EP courses, the, the, you know, the on-site courses that are associated with uh, this online part-time program, um, they are conducted uh, like after most office hours, correct? They're, what are, what are kind of like the normal hours for those on-site courses? Right, so uh, on-site courses are typically, you know, between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., let's say. Um, and, uh, you know, but that doesn't mean that, you know, that EP students are, are unwelcome. The, the, you know, if somebody has flexible work hours and wanted to take a course uh, on campus, uh, it, is a, it is an option. Um, the EP courses are designed for self-study um, at, you know, so basically uh, students taking the online courses in EP can, can do it whenever they like. I mean, they can listen to the lectures, they can do the homeworks, whether it's in the evenings or at their, you know, lunch hour or, or on the weekends. Um, and the uh, instructors in the EP program uh, establish their office hours uh, typically in the in the evenings in the 7 to 8 p.m. time frame uh, so you know it's geared towards working professionals whose whose uh, working hours are occupied by their you know by their job excellent excellent um, and the, for example, you mentioned a, a course that's conducted at the Applied Physics Laboratory. I think it was the Megatronics course. Yes. Um, so are our courses at the Applied Physics Laboratory are they typically um, between what hours? Is it, it it's like four thirty? Into the evening. Yeah. Into I mean, it, um, I don't recall the exact hours for Megatronics, but the instructor for that class is an employee at the Applied Physics Lab. So he does his day job and then he's an instructor for this course in, in the evening. I imagine it's between five and eight, it, roughly speaking, but it, it, you know, give or take an hour. Sure, sure. Um, so Dr. C, let's talk about online classes just a little bit more. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll wrap up for the evening. Um, in case anybody, unless anybody has any additional additional questions that they would like to submit, but our um, our online courses, we you know we offer we have three semesters: fall, spring, and summer. Um, fall and spring are, are 14 weeks. Summer is uh, slightly shorter. Um, can you can you give an idea of how the content is organized within the online class? Like how how does a person step through the content on a weekly basis? Um, sure. So in a 14-week semester, you might have, let's say, 12 modules, um, and a module roughly corresponds to a week, and it's divided into uh, subsections. Um, so a module might consist of an hour and a half of recorded uh, video, uh, so slides, uh, essentially like PowerPoint slides, with a narration uh, over it, uh, and then links to uh, supplemental materials and homeworks. And, you know, there'd be a homework assignment each of those 12 weeks. And then the two remaining weeks, you have a midterm week and a, and a final week. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that rounds out the, the 14 weeks. Some, uh, some courses, uh, don't have the midterm and the final. They have uh, all homeworks, so they go all 14 weeks, one module per 
per, per week. Um, and some courses have uh, final projects. Uh, so, um, so then those would have fewer modules uh, and, and then have a few weeks for, for uh, project time at the end. So that's roughly how things work. The, um, the summer courses, yes, the, the term is compressed a little bit. Uh, so it's on a faster cycle. It's on a basically a six day cycle rather than a seven day cycle. So, you know, what you would normally be doing in seven, seven day week during the, the fall and spring terms, the same course offered over the summer would be slightly faster, but it's the same content just compressed by, uh, you know, six days fitting in what would normally be fit into seven days. Excellent. And you, and you mentioned exams. Um, I had, one attendee asked, how do exams work in online classes? Uh, well, it works uh, pretty much the same way the homeworks work uh, in that, you know, uh, the exam is given, the student is given uh, a certain amount of time to do the exam, just like they would be given a certain amount of time to do the homework. Uh, and then the uh, the instructor grades it and provides uh, feedback. All right, all right, well, excellent. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of our questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you for giving us, you know, a little a little time out of your evening to to hear about this program. And Dr. C, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you so much for all of this great information. My pleasure. All right, uh, everyone, just so that you know, uh, I did record this evening's presentation, and once we have posted it online, I will email you uh, the URL so you have access to this presentation uh, in the future. If any of you have any questions uh, after this presentation, if, if you walk away and you think to yourself, oh, I really wish that I asked Dr. C this, this particular question, uh, feel free to just email those questions to me. Uh, my email address is cheryl.williams at jhu.edu, um, or you can just reply to the email that you received with your login credential for today's uh, event, and I will forward those questions on to Dr. C. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and end our presentation. Thank you again for joining us, and please stay in touch. We look forward to hearing from you soon.